much of a success. I mean, I was around for an hour or two. Um, I, I'm sure I think they're pretty. <laughs> okay. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Current, the Zoomcast that we started last semester and um, that ran, I think, for nine weeks in total um, in the lead up to Christmas. Um, we're very happy to be back again this time around, um, starting in early February, hoping to run uh, certainly t in around the end of April, um, depending on how things go. And our idea is really the same, to have a range of different kinds of uh, contributors and items. We have set ourselves this broad theme of uh, charting a course because we found that maybe some of the more resonant items last time around were those that dealt with how people were, I guess, found their way within the discipline of architecture, whether in architectural practice or um, maybe um, heading off into related fields of research and, and work. And then also a question of how it is that we in architecture can find our way in the world and a world that's increasingly, let's say, by other forces and urgent um, questions and urgent issues. Um, so that's really what we mean by charting a course. And as last time around, we're also keen um, that we have a lot of uh, student involvement and student led um, and strands and initiatives. And also that, we, of course, we will have contributions um, from across all the schools uh, in Ireland. But to kick things off, um, we have a new initiative, as, although it's arising a little bit from some of the um, uh, items on favorite books that we ran last time round. Um, but um, we're um, um, but um, we're we're starting with this um, uh, regular uh, book club, uh, which is the idea is that we everybody does a, reads a book or an item, and then uh, we have an opportunity just to discuss it. And really, the, the the emphasis is very much on trying to generate a conversation. So it's not like one of our more um, our items is more like a presentation. It's more like a uh, an open discussion. And, and to kick things off, I'm going to hand over to uh, one of the team, the current team, Steph Collins in UCD. And Steph, you're going to um, set the inaugural uh, book club in motion. The inaugural, yeah. Well, thank thank you for for reintroducing us to this current. And I just like I just want to echo that. And say, yeah, we're really excited to sort of you know kick off this. Um, you know this initiative because like last semester I th thought we did a really good job um, at sort of getting us thinking about different themes through the different presentations that we ran at lunchtime and I suppose this is sort of an extension that we want to start talking about different themes because you know we're missing connection at the moment and we need people to talk to so um, so yeah we're gonna we're gonna kick things off this each week basically we want to discuss a different text um we want the text we're going to make the text short and accessible because we're busy architects and architecture students and have no time to do anything um so this week we're kicking things off with, with an essay by Rainer Bannum uh, his his essay called a black box which I will let Mark introduce in one minute. Uh, I suppose just to say before we kick things off, if people could rename themselves uh, with the acronym from their university, if you're from a university, um, you can do that in the participants list by clicking next to your name, clicking more, and then clicking uh, rename, and you can put your university like I have on mine, UCD, and um, yeah. So because we probably don't know one another and I've extended um, I've extended invitations to different universities because we want to have this cross-discipline thing going on, but yes. So yes, welcome everybody. And I'm gonna hand over to Mark so he can introduce us to the text and then we can kick off a discussion. Hey, uh, thanks, Steph and Hugh. Um, can you hear me okay? Um, I, uh, <clears throat> because of the book club, we we've talked about this we don't want it right Steph to be a um, presentation every Monday by somebody of a subject because um, a book club is works best when the conversation enters into it and particularly when people uh, have read especially in fact have either read the text or some book clubs work where you read it at the at the at the thing itself um, so it's kind of important that it's a discussion by people who've read it whatever the text is because that's where the power of the book club always comes in. Um, 
But just to get this one going, the first text, Hugh, uh, sorry, Steph, you picked uh, Black Box. What was your reason for picking it? Uh, good question. I picked it because I, I had a read of it. Like one of the things that we were uh, doing in studio at the start of this year was looking at uh, what you were doing, the work you were doing with Rethinking the Crit. And one of the texts that was on our, our reading list was a black box. And I thought it raised some really interesting questions about about the architectural profession that sort of really resonates with me because I think through the education that I'm receiving, it's really not clear what exactly I'm supposed to be doing, doing and where exactly I'm supposed to be going. So I thought it would be a really interesting thing to discuss with other people just to get talking about it. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And th that's great because um, black, a black box has come into a certain amount of vogue in recent years. I think largely because Jeremy Till, I don't know if people know Jeremy Till, but he's been quite, pronounced in, in writing books about how architectural culture is formed. And he, he kind of reintroduced a black box into, and the black box is, is becoming kind of famous because it's kind of talking about architecture as a kind of a tribe or as a ritualistic activity, um, which has a secret way of operating that nobody can actually find out what that is. And um, just a little background, because the background is kind of relevant to Richview and UCD, which is that um, Bannum was an engineer. So this is really important. He wasn't, he never felt like an insider in architecture. He always felt like an outsider. This comes really through in, in, in the essay. Um, but he spent his whole life writing about architecture. And he did his um, PhD on, under a guy called Nicholas Pevener. And there was a debate going on in England in the 50s, but particularly the 60s, <clears throat> between two ideas of architectural history. And it's relevant because one side became very influential on what became this school in UCD. And, but Bannon was on the other side and, and Pevener. And what they're, broadly speaking, their side was, began with Pevener's idea that, by the way, Pevener is P-E-V-S-N-E, or so, so people sometimes say Pevsner, but I'm trying to be sounding like I know by, by doing that funny thing with his name. So it may not be the way to do it. But Pevener um, celebrated way, way back in the 30s, wrote a book called Pioneers of the Modern Movement, in which he celebrated the Deutsche Werkbund, the Bauhaus and Gropius. For him, modernism, and remember this debate that then happened in the 60s was all about what's going to happen to modernism. It seemed to have run out of steam. So Pevener's idea was that, um, well, Pevener's main focus was that uh, modernist, modernism happened because of technology and industry and science, and that these were the important things. And that that would be where the future, that's how Bannum picked up how the future would be. On the other side of this debate, uh, and I'm really, really simplifying things here, was Colin Rowe. And his idea was that actually, it's not really about technology. It was all about certain timeless principles of proportion and palladio and so on. And that architectural modernism was really a continuation, continuation of ancient um, the basics of eternal design. Now I'm really making a simplification here, but the people who ended up, UCD went into a crisis in the 60s and was kind of run by this group who came from London during the 70s. Um, by the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s, and by the end of the 80s, um, a certain group who had been students in London and came to, to prominence in UCD. And they were very much on, in this Colin Rowe camp. And also Aldo Rossi was important. His idea of the city as this kind of collection of archetypes and types and so forth. Um, broadly speaking, an anti-technological position of what you might call an historicist or aesthetic, aestheticization, aesthetic position. Bannum, on the other hand, um, following that other technological line, published his PhD, which he'd done under Piedner, which became theory and design in the first machine age. And in it, he said the way forward for architecture was to look back to the futurists and look at their embracing of the machine and technology. And he saw the future being to do with real science, not just the symbol of science. He accuses Corbusier of 
using machine as just as an aesthetic, using it as a symbol. He wanted to follow instead people like Buckminster Fuller. Um, and later he became champions of people like Archie Graham and the Smithsons because he wanted architect, he saw the future of architecture and in team 10 and so forth as being much more based on science, whether the social sciences or technology and less to do with history and aesthetics. That's really crude reduction of that whole thing. But it, it is kind of, it remains relevant because UCD is very much under the sway still um, of that wing of, of that debate. So this essay, um, and again, I'm probably going to go on for a little bit too long, uh, but I'll try and wind up and just introduce the essay. It was actually written at the very end of Bannum's career. In fact, published two years after he died in The New Statesman. And in it, he's kind of given up trying to figure out what architects do. And he kind of goes, we really don't know what it is because it's just like a black box. We know what it produces, but we've no idea what's inside it. But it's got something to do with, he, he begins by going, well, you know, it's really nothing to do with good design or even the design of buildings. I think that's a brilliant beginning. Uh, it's a real attention grabber. You know, whatever the architecture is, it's not about building design. Um, it's actually about a type of drawing invented in Italy in the early 15th century. Um, and he uses Christopher Alexander's pattern, you know, that thing where Christopher Alexander has these books where he goes, if you design a square and it looks like this, then it should work. And if it doesn't, if you don't, or the window seat should be like this. And if you put all these patterns together, you get good architecture. Um, and Bannon says, this is the kind of thing that architects are socialized into when they're in the tribal longhouse of the architectural school studio. And the ritual of the crit is where this socialization takes place. And it's got nothing to do with good design because lots of things that are purely architectural are really bad designs and lots of really good designs are not architecture. He wants to get rid of all of those things that architects want to claim as architectural, like grain silos and biplanes and you know, igloos and so on. And you know, architecture is just this practice that began in the Mediterranean basin. And it's a series of arguments about drawing. And he calls it a pattern, like a me the meta pattern is this disegno. And he ends the essay by going, um, architects are threatened by computers. This was way back in when this was written in the 88, um, because computers threaten to show up the fact that architects really have nothing to offer because everything can be done by machines. And that he has a good swipe at Frampton when he goes, you know, the resistance is, of drawing to the computer is this kind of cant of uh, some kind of heroic resistance. And that he goes, well, unless architects reveal what's in their black box, then most people will just have the suspicion that there's nothing there at all. It's just a bag of tricks, which actually has nothing in it. So. It's, um, that's the kind of general background to, to Bannum and to that debate and to the essay. I kind of went on a bit too long, Steph, but I couldn't get it any shorter. You couldn't be more concise. That's okay. No, that's, I think that's okay. I think it's important to sort of, you know, remind ourselves what, what the essay was actually about. And I, I guess from there, I might ask if anybody has any initial responses and what wants to sort of jump in and kick us off and if, if you if you want to like you can unmute yourself freely you can turn on your camera and, and join in the conversation i know uh... sorry i'm Bruno. fine <laughs> i'm sorry Hi. no i was just thinking about for the time that like i think the first thing i've ever said to a tutor and this was in first year hang on let me turn on my camera um the first thing that I said to a tutor was, are we not going to be replaced by machines anyway? You know, and I, <laughs> I got a few stares. <laughs> I think it, I think that could be an interesting place to start as well. Like what Bannon was saying uh, about drawing by hand, resisting computers is, is an act of defiance or a submission to this this black box, this this ritual that nobody really knows what it is. And I think Mark, I know you do all of your drawing by hand and you don't really use computers. And I wonder how you feel about that. Uh, I don't, I never saw it as a, an act of resistance because I don't think, I think the craft ideology is one of the most insidious forms of ideology as a resistance to capitalist predation, to say that we can solve all of the problems by returning to some medieval craft guild 
in which all relations of production were, were perfect um, is the most insidious move of all. I mean, the Middle Ages, I mean, Marx is pretty clear that, you know, the bourgeois revolution uh, produced extraordinary wealth and opportunity and emancipation and destroyed centuries of prejudice and so forth. And um, so I draw by hand uh, because I was too mean to get a computer years ago. And then my work never got beyond a certain scale where I was just kind of drawing and I can rub things out and it's not like, you know, it makes much of a difference. And, you know, engineers get irritated with me, but you know, I, whatever, people want to, want to communicate in this way. But I, it's not it's not a reason I like to do watercolors and things. And the big thing was teaching, because it turns out that they want people want to teach architects how to draw by hand in first year. So it turned out that I still had the skill that could be um, I won't say leveraged because that would suggest that I'd actually made any money out of this. But you know what I mean, that it was some kind of a useful skill for educational purposes. Yeah, I, th I think that that kind of approaches some of the the questions that Bannon was raising about like what what actually is architecture and he's almost highlighting the fact that th there's a, a crisis at the moment where architecture doesn't know how to define it and I, mean, I know this this essay was published in, in 1996 or, or whenever but like I, I think a lot of that is even more relevant today because certainly from from my perspective it feels like our education is really technology centered and and focused on, on like the engineering the practicality side of things whereas it feels like you know architects aren't the best at doing that job like there are people that are specialized in that like the idea of creating space and structure like that's something that engineers do so i mean like yes it's important for us to know it but then it's like why is it important for us to know it so we can communicate with the people who are do our jobs better like what what, what in fact is the job of the architect and I think it's something that Bannum's really questioning and I think it's a really important question that we should approach as well I don't know if anybody has thoughts on that yeah I, I think um I, I think first of all Mark well done on the synopsis there of the situation in UCD in the late 70s early 80s it was a product of that uh I didn't feel like I'd, I'd never really seen it in such uh, stark terms but uh makes a lot of sense now that you mention it but I, I do think one thing that I, I used to be a sort of a, I used to be very much more interested in reading Bannum I, when I lived, I used to live in America, I lived there for a while. And I always felt that, you know, somehow when you, well, well as I did, when you live in New York, somehow the American, the sort of the, the modern experience, the, the latest debates about architecture somehow break down between what's happening in New York and what's happening in Los Angeles. And I think that Bannum was very much playing into that kind of uh, debate. And it strikes me since I've come back and uh, to live in Ireland that it strikes me that there is some sort of flaw in Bannum's presumptions and maybe the Colin Rowe presumptions as well, that somehow at their, they always accept as the starting point that the Anglo-Saxon tradition of architecture in the late 20th century is the one that counts or is the dominant one. And I'm not sure his analysis applies if we start looking at you know, at work elsewhere, um, that if, even when he talks about sort of the definition of architecture, I just sort of feel, well, like if you look at it from a separate perspective, perhaps a Japanese perspective, your answer might be ma, but it, does, it never comes into his discussion. So that when he's sort of saying, oh, there's a crisis or there's a problem, or say with uh, Baroque architecture, he chooses Wren and Hawksmoor, mm -hmm. but never starts off with the position of saying, well, we're either from Baroque. You know, uh, you know, and, and I, I find that, uh, I find it interesting. I find it, I really do find it, I find it interesting that uh, there is. No. We lost Gary. Just at that critical moment. <laughs> oh no. Anyone else? What he's unpredictable. <laughs> Gary's disconnected there. I think I'm. I think it's an interesting, interesting point that that Gary was getting to was like the 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 fact that a certain type of architecture or a certain architectural typology is architecture, whereas the rest of them aren't so much there. And it, it's something that Bannum raises as well, where he was talking about uh, Pevener Pevener's position on uh, the difference between a. Um, uh, a cathedral and a bike shed, um, whereas a cathedral is architecture, but a bike shed can't be architecture. And his 
his point was that a cathedral is designed with aesthetic preconceptions, whereas a bike shed isn't. And I just thought it was interesting because like, like Bannum, Bannum also discusses the, the different, like what, what constitutes the corpus of architecture? Like is architecture the entirety of any built environment or is it only certain selections of it that are designed by certain people? Um, anyone, anyone on this? Because I, I definitely got something to say, but I'd love to hear somebody else. It, 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 I mean, uh, I mean, maybe just <clears throat> picking up on what Gary was saying. I mean, it is also a very insider's outsider view. I, mm -hmm. uh, like it's a very knowing view, and I actually, I, I confess, I don't one hundred percent get what he, the distinction he makes between Wren and Hawksmore, for instance. But you have to take it as a given in order to go with the piece, and then equally later on, Meese versus. I can't remember who it is, but I mean they're very, they're they're actually very insidery, connoisseurial, connoisseurial if that's a word, judgments mm -hmm. that he's making, um, and so <clears throat> he's sort of playing a, and, and I mean I remember there's there's another Mark you'll remember the name of it the famous piece he did where he runs two texts simultaneously with two definitions of architecture. One is the sort of classic technology. Um, what is architecture as an aesthetic code, I guess, effectively, and the other, or a cultural and a, and a cultural product, and the other is like it's it's to do with technology and it's to do with services, and it's to, like he talks about architecture as could be an act of uh, actually distributing a vaccine in a particular place because it enables people to live in a particular environment, and he runs the two texts side by side. I can't remember the name of the piece. It's in the, that collection of Critic Rights. Um, I know it, yeah. But it's very, it's very, it, it's it's as if he's actually comfortable enough sitting, like Pevsner in a way. I'm sorry, I've got the old school <laughs> version of Pevsner, but, but like Pevsner, I, I think you can position Pevsner like he's as much reacting against Pevsner's connoisseurship, isn't he? And, as picking up on the, that the connections back to pioneers in the modern movement, the Werkbund and so on. So I don't know. I mean, I just, I found the piece, I always think that that piece of writing is like, it's better summarized than read in a way. Like it's better taken up by somebody like Jeremy Till so that the main point is crystallizes and, and is clarified. But actually when you start reading it, it's kind of, I, I, it's somehow less convincing, I, I, I think. I disagree. I, I'd say it's it's almost better to read it because I think the point that Bannon, Bannon's trying to make is that it's it's not clear and to almost crystallize a point of, of what he's trying to make would, would miss the point entirely. Because yeah. he, he does go back and forth a lot. He's prepared to say Rand's not an architect. Whatever an architecture is, Rand doesn't have it. Hawksmoor does in spades. Yeah. But is, he, is he looking at the the perceptions of who these architects are like is Wren is Wren seen as an architect where Hawksmore is I think his his final comparison is between Wren and uh and Mies and like you know we accept me like from, from the education like from from um what's the word from like architectural history and theory that we're being taught like Mies is an architect like he is yeah you know forefather of modernism etc whereas like we don't learn about you know other thing and we don't know another point that he was making was like about about um almost vernacular architecture buildings that don't have architects and it's like do we need to yeah. include them in the corpus of architecture or what we consider architecture or is it is that something else entirely and then is it is it cultural appropriation for us to draw upon from that or is it bad should we only be looking at architecture or what i think he um, wants to um he, his polemics is that this disenio, it's not, you know, go back to this idea, architecture is not about building design. You know, it's a great start really. Um, because, you know, that kind of gets your attention. You know, well, what is it about then? Um, if it's not about good building design. And he goes, well, oh, it's a type of drawing that they invented in Italy in this 15th century. And actually when you meditate on that, you start to see the sense of it. What he really means by architecture in that sense is that discourse that we call architecture, that, that discussion that began with, you know, 
Bruno Leski and Alberti, and then continues ever since then as a kind of a two in and fro in about whether architecture is about the existing city or whether it's about, you know, ex novo, some kind of, you know, knocking everything down and building, building afresh. Um, and he wants to remove all of the things that architects claim to be under their remit in order that we can remember this. If this was written on what they used to call the continent, um, maybe they still do. I read recently that you can't say the continent anymore. There's something British, Britishist or UKist about that. Um, but what, if it was written on the continent, they would, he would have used the word structuralist because what this is, is an attempt to confine architecture to, in a structuralist sense, to a type of language which actually doesn't depend on any of its reference. It's, and its reference, the things that it claims to be about are all, you know, they're shifting. They're not really fixed at all. What it is instead is, it's a type of practice which has its own connections, internal connections between signifiers and concepts, or between signs and concepts. Um, and he calls it a pattern. He uses this idea of a, a meta pattern, uh, a master, um, a master something. Anyway, uh, Gary, you got just disconnected. Um, yes, I was in the middle of my flow, and I saw so everybody was stunned into the stony silence, and I thought, my God, I've really shocked everybody. It was incredible, and then I realized I was cut off. Uh, but sorry, Mark, I, I'm sure you, you I, I think I probably got the point. But I, I, just to pick up the point you just made there, Mark, which I think is really interesting, is I wonder, <laughs> I mean, is there, like, you know, you said, you know, if this had been written on the continent, like who 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 would have written it on the continent? Like who is thinking along these lines in the late twentieth century or twenty first century on the continent? Uh, Bar, you know, Barth. Uh, hmm. You know, I'm thinking of Barth. It's it's the kind of thing you would have found in that sort of writing of, um, you know, where you know what I'm talking about the zero degree monument or whatever, where things are forget all of the associations that we've assumed. This is um, this yeah, is a type okay. of language. Or Bourdieu, yeah. you know, Bourdieu's analysis of practice is, has been really just a set of things which evolve within a within their, their closed frameworks. I, I think what's interesting though is I, I'm trying to think of something in particular about something I read that of Barth in relation to architecture, it's just not coming to me straight away. But I, I think that Bannum at some point, like in a sense, it's almost as if he's he hasn't found a definition of architecture for himself, which is satisfactory, and he's presuming there isn't one. Whereas Bart comes down on the side of the existence of architecture, that it is there, it's a phenomenon, which I think is an interesting, mm. which is, I think is an interesting thing. Like, I, I find that, that when Bannum is, he, and he's making the presumption about, like, as, you know, these the collection of structures which go to make this thing, which is a structure called architecture, like it, it's like the, uh, philosophical thing it's to somehow not take into account that something like the Teatro Olimpico exists and it cannot be defined within the terms that he's choosing or that the Campidoglio exists you know that we go there and we go I'm having an architectural experience and it's not anything to do with a style of drawing or a view of science it is a manipulation of space that is undeniable and it's happening before my happening before my eyes before my senses i, th I think that's actually a, re a really interesting thing to pick up on because like banham certainly does seem to be saying that architecture doesn't have a definition and, and he, it almost seems to me that he's arguing that like it's it's a thing that doesn't is, is not necessary is not critical and i think the thing that you say about like there are certain um spatial experiences that we can have that we we can associate with the field of architecture and I think Bannum is not necessarily disregarding those but he's more coming from a, a modernist critique point of view where it's like like after 100 years of modernism or after like where we are now 100 and say 110 over over a century of, of modernism we're kind of sitting here like what's the point of our profession because I think we almost need to look at it from the the through the lens of like what's actually happening at the moment in architecture like rather than boiling it down to to abstract what is architecture was like well how does this apply to to our current modes of practice how does this apply to our current modes of teaching 
Um, yeah, could we, could we actually to try and maybe Steph and others, maybe to try and get some of the students in into the discussion more. Um, if people read this, what do they feel about this idea of the tribal longhouse, the idea of socialization? He quotes James, James Abercrombie as saying that architecture socialized into, he tells the joke about the person bleeding to death on the street and the doctor is trying to ask, has anyone got a pencil to, to make a tourniquet, or tourniquet to stop the bleeding? And an architect goes, will a 2B do? Um, those, that idea that is, that we're just, Gary Stevens is brilliant on this. He's that, that the favorite circle that um, arcane arcana of practice. What about, you know, this thing that students come in, I see it all the time and they don't have a clue what the architects are on about. The thing, the, the, these tutors of theirs, has anyone got any, does anyone read this and felt that it spoke to them from that point of view? I'm gonna, I, I wanna come in again because I, I was thinking about this when I was rereading it just before this because in our architectural studio, in one of our architectural studio, I can't remember exactly when, but somebody asked a question and um, the response from the tutor was, that's more of an architectural question than it is a question of technology. And I thought it raised some interesting questions around like architecture. Archite I, th I always thought of architecture as like a, a, a product of, of a bunch of th different things like anthropology and technology and engineering. And the role of the architect is almost to be a visionary to try and synthesize all of these things. Yes, when you ask a question about technology and you get a response saying that's more of an architectural question, it almost assumes that architecture and technology are mutually exclusive rather than technology or architecture being a child of technology or whatever product of it. Um, I'm, I'm completely convinced that technology among my, my colleagues in UCD is a stylistic position always. It's an aesthetic position, which attempts to ground itself in claims to objectivity. But this is true of architectural claims generally. Miesian, Mises claims to, uh, you know, the purely what's called Hegelian, he claims to have solved the problems of the era you know the absolute spirit of all of the, the this great resolution of technology with the, the human that's not a that's not a condition that's specific to architecture i mean all yeah all modes of um all kinds of roles all kinds of practices religious social you know engineers lawyers doctors they all have codes they all live according to codes and patterns and where they there's a sort of originally uh, or essential sort of let's say quality assigned to certain things that actually of course is just a, stru a, a sort of a structure structured position so i mean that's the other thing about this is is he saying that this is this applies only to the field of architecture or if we were to look at any field of activity in the same way we might find at least similar yeah, yeah he doesn't i I don't think Hugh, he's, he's just counting that. He says, this is just another mode of design. It's not about good design. Uh, it's not even about the design of buildings, strictly speaking, but it's a mode of design, he calls it. And yes, he doesn't discount, doesn't exclude what you suggest. Mm. But I think it is relevant that there is a claim in architecture to be able to particularly to solve so problems in the social field. And we see this again and again, that architecture, for instance, sets itself up as some kind of antidote to the predations of capitalism, to the commodification of space. I mean, a typical, typical piece of UCD can't, and I'm just, yeah, look, I love UCD, don't get me wrong, and it's probably true everywhere else as well, is this relentless invoking of the problem of public space. It isn't a problem of public space. The problem we have is a problem of a private space. There isn't enough private space for people can afford to live in cities. There's no end of bleeding public space. You could spend all your day tramping around public space but it won't do you any good if you can't afford to live in the city. So there, that's one of the classic moments where architecture um, reifies and, and um, fetishizes the city. I mean, I think also the corollary is true that, that there's certain, and I think it's doubly true of Jeremy Till, that the, the sort of the idea of that they are the people with the super enlightened capacity to reveal this mm -hmm. box, you know, hey, actually architecture depends. I mean, what a dumb title, like, it's not like Mies didn't know that. Do you know what I mean? I mean, he t calls out Mies all the time in that book, but it's, you know, Mies knew 
exactly what he was doing in relation to all the kind of one may like it or not but he was fully aware of what was going on within the black box and in, maybe not entirely in control of it but he was aware of it i mean well, i don't really know how you can say he was aware of it though well i mean he was aware, of course he was aware of the, the herbert greenwald the developer who was helping him to make the first development near iit and then lakeshore drive he knew the economics he knew what was driving the design he knew how to make plans that would make sense in terms of where the core is all that stuff he just knew it and he also had some other ideas that he was bringing to bear i mean people he are knows more... that he had no interest in changing the world though and i think like at least in in that's my education at the moment it feels like there's a huge emphasis put on like the fact that architecture has the power to change the world and that it's almost a duty of architects to do exactly that so this brings into question like have we lost what's in the black box if we're saying that Mies knew what was in the black box but we seem to be focusing on an output that's entirely different and almost contradictory well i suppose i'm not i'm, I'm saying that the i think actually there's a sort of the insistence <laughs> i mean it, well I mean, bannon is very like he's very he's, he's a great writer and a great you know thinker and so on so like to insert this idea of the black box is brilliant because the minute you start to push against it you seem like you're reinforcing it if you know what i mean like to, for somebody to argue against saying well it's not a black box i'm charging it was of course you would say that that's the black box you know that's the black box in operation so it, there's something um i mean it is a sort of a brilliant position because it can't in a way it cannot be dismantled <laughs> You, I, I think it's interesting the point that you were making there about uh, like all disciplines, all professions, whatever. Uh, you know, they have a code of justification or whatever. You know, whatever, whatever you might want to call that thing. I do think though that architects are a little bit more guilty of uh, pursuing that line of argument to justify themselves and of overegging their own position. Like, I mean, for the for the neuroscientist, for the for the brain surgeon. If he screws up, the patient dies. So he can't, have, you know, there's uh, at some level, there's something very compelling about moving in a particular direction. Whereas with architects, it's not quite that. And therefore, it strikes me that, for, and this is going not just in, it's not a recent phenomenon, it's over as long as I can remember. And then my reading of going back through the 20th century is that there's this constant need to justify that architects seem to have to justify what it is that they do without actually talking about the fact that they make space. And I find it very odd. But you don't need an architect to make space though. Like you, anybody can make space. Uh, uh, Haley had a, wanted to say something. I just wanted to get to get to bring Haley in. Have you finished making your lunch, Haley? And you're ready to. Uh... Sorry, as you can see, evidenced by my juice box, I have indeed prepared my food. Um, <laughs> I was just gonna say, uh, I don't know where this came in. I've I've been just kind of going back and forth between between cooking and listening, but um, this idea that uh, I think what Benham does when he talks about the black box is he points out that it's all it's not about architecture at all. It's about power and the power of a certain type of discourse. Um, I don't think um, the question like I think architects could talk all day about what architecture is um and like it would be interesting and we can debate it but i think kind of his um important conclusion here is that we have the specific way of talking about and teaching architecture um and there's a reason well maybe he doesn't get to a reason for it but at least it has certain effects um and i think this idea at least just thinking about it kind of my immediate reaction is that I think as Hugh may have pointed out that um, it has the effect of, of making it quite exclusive and setting up this power dynamic between, at least in the architecture studio, between tutor and student, this idea that um, architecture is this thing you can't quite define. And this special thing is also going to happen in the studio by which that secret knowledge will be transmitted. Um, yeah. And I don't, really know if I believe in all that, but I think it's interesting. I think he does a good job of pointing it out by using this metaphor of a black box. Yeah, excellent. Anyone, anyone would like to follow on on that? Any, particularly any of the students who haven't spoken? Alice, Neil, Emily, Roisin, Alba, Phoebe, Harry, 
Yeah. Remember this, no, no students like to be called on because they're all scared of being, <laughs> being destroyed by, by uh, you, um, you, 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 you should yeah, turn on I your can, camera. I can say something. I um, I didn't get a chance to read the, the full thing, so I, that's why I felt kind of nervous to, to chip in, but just like leading on from the discussion and stuff. Um, I think like recently, uh, one of my tutors who is not an architect um, is actually Ellen Rowley. Um, she said something to me that uh, like just explained architecture in a way that would just didn't, that, that no other tutor had ever said before, like explained that or just something like just, she said something and I had like a light bulb moment. And I just thought it was really interesting that, mm. um, that she's not an architect, like she's, a, she's an architectural historian and I think and among many other things. And um, of all the tutors I've had, like she kind of t was able to clarify something that just had given me this light bulb moment and just explained it in one sentence and made me think about it in a whole new way. And I just thought that was really interesting because I do I do think that when you're in studio, you, it feels like architecture is on a pedestal um, and that 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 pedestal kind of comes from this like deference that we all kind of seem to absorb somewhere along the line that we have this like master and apprentice uh, vibe in the studio um, and sometimes that can be a barrier to to kind of like navigating your own your own way in architecture if that makes sense yeah absolutely I, I completely agree with everything you said anyone else have experience experiences that might be that might uh, contribute anyone like to If I may just go back to Mies for a second, I was I took off my shelf a line from Mies, which I love. This is this is this is a, I love this. this is pure architectural cant here. I have tried to make an architecture for a technological society. He said, "I have wanted to keep everything reasonable and clear to have an architecture that anyone can do." I really believe that Mies believed that. The fact that it is about as untrue in its, in its terms as anything could be, um, is kind of the point here. It's a, it's, a, it's a claim about technology and about social organization, which is utterly convincing and completely disconnected from the experiences of people. That point that it's an architecture that that anybody can do, I think, yeah. is actually really interesting because Bannum goes into that as well of, of the 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 architecture of of um, what's the word uh, oh a pattern pattern architecture or whatever it's it was and um, um, I I think like to to bring it back to 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 like an Irish example, I think we should look at like Bungalow Bliss because Jack Fitzsimons wrote that book with the intention of bringing better architecture, better modes of living to the people of Ireland. Yet architects almost universally hate bungalows everywhere, even though they are designed by architects, even though they, they are buildings and can by a lot of definitions be considered architecture. But for some reason, we don't want to recognize them as good architecture or as architecture at all. Yeah. I, I... Yes, that's a really good point. And just go back to that in a second, but picking it up on Haley and Leisha, um, I would suggest that in that statement of Mies, you see an absence of the understanding of why people can't do what he claims they can do. And it has to do with the relations of production in society with the relative positions of power. And that, that architecture's socialization is uh, formations about power which disavows the existence of these relations, these access to these kind of, you know, the access to a Mucian piece of architecture is, I mean, as we all know, is completely, completely inaccessible to anything, anyone but the corporate or the super rich. Um, but it, yet it is the symbol of simplicity, it was at one point anyway, of, of utterly unsophisticated, a kind of arte povera for the billionaire class or for the corporate class um, and that begins in the studio begins precisely in those relations that you describe master apprentice relations which are distinguished by the fact that they disavow their basis in power they disown their basis in power anyone else student wiser particularly who might and particularly somebody who would disagree with that who might say no i think this is i think it's really interesting to have students who go no i disagree i think that that's a crude simplification. 
Mark, I'm far from a student. Um, and I agree with you about the fundamental problem about, uh, you know, the, the sort of the, the discussion of the, of the corporate, uh, you know, this, this uh, corporate discussion and the corporate structure within architecture. But I think that, I think there is a sort of a, a way. We lost poor Gary again. <laughs> He's been hacked by the yeah. Institute of Architects, the Royal the Reba or somebody Mark, you Mark do you, Mark because your your positioning the debate now in Marxist terms to an extent. But do you think that Bannum was thinking in that that way? No, but um I think that it wasn't it certainly wasn't because he's they're all desperately in england i think everyone in england is always desperately keen to to be you know jolly reasonable all, all the time um no nonsense and uh, you know no, nobody wants to give any hint that they might have read a book of theory because otherwise they could be i don't know chased out of it um and that's a bit of again a little bit cheap but um there's no he's not marxist but he he definitely he's literal about technology and ultimately Bannum saw like his idea, like Archie Graham and so on, and, and Bucky Fuller and even the Smithsons. Like he really thought that there could be some kind of social revolution, uh, social technical revolution, Cedric Price, that kind of stuff, you know, that there would be a, a popular, accessible. I mean, everyone's trying for this, including Mies. It's not to say that there's bad faith here, it's to say that the modo architectorum, this is the term he uses, uh, is distinct from this. I do feel Bannum really believed in the possibilities of a futurism. And mm -hmm. in this essay, he's kind of giving up and going, look at, I throw in my hat here, or I throw in whatever the expression. The Marxist thing for me just goes without saying, it's just the social relations that underlie things that once we take them out of it, once we take out of the access to wealth, uh, the actually existing access to wealth, then all arguments then have to be seen like in that context. Any, any, any other students, by the way, just love to hear students. Thank you, Leisha and Hayley. Anyone else? Or maybe more from Leisha and Hayley? <laughs> or Seth? Maruna? You're going to <laughs> unmute? <laughs> no. Yeah, yes. but, okay, so <laughs> I, I have like an idea in mind, but I don't know how to formulate it properly. I just like, I personally kind of disagree with like now maybe like it was in the past with the the master student relationship you know I don't like okay like you guys are all saying I haven't also haven't read the book so I don't really feel that like qualified to comment or anything you know um but I feel like do you all think that that master student relationship still exists I think it wants to exist but is also <laughs> wanting to not exist because consciously everybody is saying that it's a bad thing and and you know at least in our experience like a lot of our tutors almost want to reject that idea of the master student relationship mm -hmm. but then to me that feels like the entire education is falling apart then because it's like when, when you recognize how subjective how subjective it is mm -hmm. and how subjective like th this teaching of architecture is then you realize that the doing it in the studio is almost a fruitless endeavor so like i feel like it, it wants to not exist but it also wants to exist and the yeah. conflict almost in the formation of this master student dynamic i kind of yeah. i kind of think it depends on like percept like perspective as well like i don't know you can kind you can see it i feel like people can like see it oh these guys are like gods you know there are gods they're teaching us our future and all that but you can also see it as like these are human beings you know they're just like me they're just passing down their knowledge you know and therefore they're teacher rather than master the thing the difference maruna i firmly believe in bourdieu's analysis of all teaching depends upon pedagogic authority what he calls pedagogic authority and that precisely is power given by the state mm -hmm. to decide on people's futures in material terms and in architecture it's very vivid you get judgments passed on on your work by people who have the power collectively no, no one individual maybe, to determine your future economically, your ability to, to call yourself an architect. And this pedagogic authority uh, actually is the reason you're here. Like if, if none of your tutors had it, you wouldn't turn up, you go somewhere where they were because you want 
this thing that you're getting in any school. And if any teacher says to you, I don't have that authority, I'm one of you, then the whole thing falls apart. It, it all depends on that authority. The thing is to acknowledge it and not to, um, not to pretend that it doesn't exist. You can't not like every other profession, no, can't you? Yeah, no, this, this is not just about architecture, but there are okay. certain characteristics about architectural discourse. But yes, the, the crit and the studio definitely refer back to medieval forms of production. The, the master-apprentice relationship is definitely there. That notion of learning your trade at the feet of the master. And those kind of relations have a particular role to play, particularly vis-a-vis -vis technology particularly vis-a-vis -vis conditions of production. I definitely do think the crit is a problem. <laughs> hey, Maruna, you don't think which? No, no, I said I definitely do think the crit is a problem. I think that's... Yeah, it's, it's symbolic violence. It is that power to, uh, power to impose meanings, which hides its basis in, in actual social powers and so power relations, which contributes its own symbolic power to those social relations. That's how Bourdieu defines it. Crit is a brilliant example of the exercise of symbolic, <laughs> symbolic violence, um, and which occasionally, the reason we have all these things about crits is because occasionally the veil slips and we go, gosh, that is violent actually, such a symbolic violence. That's a bloody awful way to talk to people. That isn't the way we should carry on in the university. And the, in other words, the hegemony starts to go. So we have to recover it by reappearing in front of you and going actually we're really good at heart we really want your interests uh, we really support your interests which we do but there are relations there which which relations of power there i think mark i would somewhat disagree with the fact that um the the, the teachers the the studio choosers are the be all and end all when it comes to like the power that exists in terms of future what's the word future what was the word they used future ability to earn or future capacity for earning admission and, to the profession yeah yeah i think like to a certain extent that's true in terms of assessment but ultimately like there are these accrediting bodies which will ultimately determine whether or not you are architect enough mm -hmm. um and of course that will be defined by the work that you do in in your five years of training etc and that is ultimately influenced by you but i wouldn't say that as studio tutors, you have the power. I would say almost you you have you have the power to pass and fail, but like you don't have the power to dictate future earning potential. Mark, would you fail anybody if you really wanted to? Sorry, Marina. Would you fail anybody if you really wanted to? It's not that. It's that uh, every single teacher you've ever had that I've ever had his his granted authority by the state outside of homeschooling. And this is the thing that we have to keep referring back to. What, what is this thing? What is the role of the state in, in um, ascribing this power? And what's the purpose of it? And of course, you start to see then that one of the main purposes of it is, is imposing meanings which support the dominant classes. So the, the, uh, the, the ideas of the ruling class in every epoch are the ruling ideas. How does this happen? Well, it used to be the church. It still is in many cases, but it's now also or for a long time the educational system. Yeah. We do wonderful things in education, but we are also imposing meanings which tend to reproduce dom the dominant uh, power relations. Steph, you were going to say. Somebody, somebody else was about to jump in there. Sorry. I was just going to say, so like in terms of pedagogic, pedagogic authority, mm. do we ever, if education is a lifelong thing, then do we ever get to a point where it's like, okay, you're free now, you are the master. Brilliant. No stage brilliant. anymore. <laughs> like where, where, where is the end? That's a brilliant. Uh, that's a brilliant way of unplugging the whole Bourgeoisie and, uh, analysis in a really interesting way. And I never even thought of that for you. Know, what point do you yeah, become like, emancipated, yeah. liberated by this? There's no, a question. Ian, sorry, if I could, um, if I could just jump in there and um, what Leisha said, I completely agree. And to a certain extent, I believe that the student has more power than the lecturer or tutor and what you say in certain ways, like, of course, you know, what you were saying, I completely agree with that. But I do think the student holds a certain amount of power for their own learning, too. So, yeah. In quite a bit more, Phoebe, could you say a good example of what you mean or do you want to? Or like, really I mean... It's how you interpret things. You're given a brief to do a project, but you can completely interpret that your own way. You know, you don't have to just follow it. 
in set terms like there is a freedom to it as well and it's up to the student to kind of I don't know allow themselves explore that and not just say oh but I'll be marked down because of this if I do my own thing I'll be marked down I think it's there's a freedom to it that allows the student to control and have the power to I think I think that that take on it is really interesting but I think that um like it sounds to me and I hope you don't take this the wrong way but it sounds to me like you seem to have always had like a good level of confidence in what you're doing and maybe like crits or things haven't or feedback hasn't affected you in some way that might like bring you down or make it negative or make you doubt yourself and like I guess like do do you have like could you elaborate a bit more on that like do you think I'd that like that... to jump in and just say that I'm only a first year student and like we've only just gone through the continuous assessment and the whole process of all that so I haven't really got to that stage of it yet and of course like there's going to be um comments that will bring you down and kind of make you think a lot more but just as a, a brief general kind of outlook on things I think it's up to a student to 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 kind of control how they learn in a way if that makes sense okay yeah so i'm phrasing that properly <laughs> no totally. i think that's that's really interesting that you say that as a first year because like i'm i'm only a second year and i actually share a lot a lot of what you what you feel because like to a certain extent um it does feel like the the uh what's the word like what, what mark was saying that um that teachers have power and i think that's that's something that we've been indoctrinated through 13 years of formal education that like you are a student there is a teacher the teacher has the information you want the information and there is that power dynamic that exists but if you can recognize that that exists and almost consciously reject it and say that you have the power and can convince yourself thus then you will have the power you know and i think i think to add on that as well there's something on, on the student side that gives them power and that is the power of, of collection and the fact that like there are more students than teacher so if you have an entire class of students that recognize that exact point that you're making that the students have the will and uh, yeah. Steph, do you know that in 1968 and hugh are you listening to this i'm sure you know it already but they kicked out the professor in 1968 <laughs> the students ganged up and uh, got the professor booted out because he wasn't doing a good job is that right hugh that's, well, actually, funnily enough, I have to go right now. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll take that as my cue, Mark. That's fine. <laughs> well, just, just following Steph's point, the students have massive power. Yeah, absolutely. And that's also saying if the if your teachers have power, it's because you give it to them. They only have power because you give it to them. See you, Hugh. And they the only it's well. the two ways. It's a two way relationship power, but not in the i mean this is a bit technical not in the foucauldian sense that all relationships are power relations everything is just some you know random relationship no there are dominant interests that's the thing to remember and in most places the state is the representative of those dominant interests and just to, i know step you're on to point and i don't to, to, if you extrapolate this to architecture general generally the big issue is to what extent is architecture critical of the relations of production that dominate our society in what in what uh, to what extent can it be autonomous can architecture actually stop being just in the service of capital or the ruling the ruling class and become a critical force well obviously it can be but how would though that criticality manifest itself well clearly precisely as you say phoebe in realizing your own power as a student to begin your education by insisting on your own autonomy your own critical distance from those people who were put up there to tell you what's right and what's wrong Us. I, I would dare to say almost that the criticality of architecture exists without the architect so like the the idea of of like Gary was saying earlier about the creation of space and that space and that's what architects exist for and I think you know anybody can create space it's it's not hard to create structure like the the, the trabeated system of structure of, of column and beam is not something you need a degree in architecture to understand it's something that you could go out to your back garden and do and it's something that humans have been doing for for thousands of years so like what what's the need to do this five years of institutional training to do that because the simple answer Steph is the vast majority of the people in the world are struggling day to day to provide the subsistence and under the modern relations of production they have to sell their labor for this and they simply don't have the means to be constructing their 
habitations that may have been possible, that may be possible in certain uh, pre-capitalist, pre-industrial formations. Uh, it's simply not possible for most people to be building their own houses. I mean, the Irish countryside that you mentioned is a, is a classic example where that is possible because of certain conditions. So does, that mean, does that mean that the very existence of the profession then is kind of in contradiction to like its professions of uh, engendering freedom and everything like, you know, if, if these people are oppressed and if they need us to build shelter for them or to provide or to design the environment, like, are they really like able to exercise control over their environment at all then? Are they free at well, all? That's, you know, the, Alicia, you know, the whole debate around co-housing and self-build, Walter Siegel is one stream, co-housing and, you know, that all of those debates, mm -hmm. they do engage that very important point about the agency of people assemble for example those kind of new people looking at architecture you know that's that's not a new thing actually architecture without architects and but you know broadly speaking most people are trying to survive most people are working people and it's not within their means for for time reasons as much as anything else to be making their own houses and mm -hmm. I think for us to focus on that as architects is very often to create in a, a kind of a bit like Haley you, you know the problem with anarchism as a as, a, as an alternative to uh, the capitalist, you know, it doesn't give people a way to imagine other ways of organization that's practicable. Uh, I in think most to, to Leisha's point though, like if, if, we, if we see ourselves like as a profession, if we see architecture as, as the, the liberators almost, like we're the people that can provide shelter that is suited to one's needs or something like that does not does that not create another paradynamic in and of itself like we all of a sudden have the power as architects over the individual inhabitants of space yeah it's not power that's the problem it's the ownership of the means of production by one class as opposed to the others so we don't as progressives we're all i presume at this stage all Marxist progressives here, revolution, socialist, Gary, everyone. Hugh is gone, so we're, we can all talk freely among each other. Um, <laughs> as, as, uh, as revolutionary socialists, we, if, if the dominant force in society was egalitarian, we would entirely support it. You know, but we, we recognize that there are needs of forms, of, of social forms. You know, just look at what happened in America a month ago. And just if you really think that it's great that everything just decided by whoever happens to turn up and shout the loudest, you know, I, well, there's power. It's just a question of how that power is used and in whose interest, which class is exercising. To, to your point then, why is the social question not addressed in architectural education? Why is it given lip service? Because of, but it's because of the, fetishization of the, the fetishization of the city, the idea of the city, that's one of the reasons, is a, as a timeless uh, product. Like Christopher Alexander pat pattern idea that the city is somehow or other a collection of more or less ideal arrangements of spaces and objects. And to remove from that the driving force of production, the idea that these things happen because of the drive, what, what produces the city is the drive towards production and therefore all of the relations of production which go with that.